Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, an Olympic gold medal, groundbreaking international conferences on religious cooperation and tolerance, membership in the World Bank, the IMF and other international bodies, and recognition by more than 110 countries. These are only some of the accomplishments of the young nation of Kosovo, or Kosovo, as I've often referred to it. The United States was among the first to recognize Kosovo, and today we are its strongest backer, and rightfully so. First re recognized by President Bush, relations only deepened under President Obama. For that, Kosovo proudly has become the strongest supporter of the United States in Europe, sitting at an 85% approval rating. This is not to say that Kosovo is a perfect country. We're not a perfect country. Corruption needs to be attacked in Kosovo. Judicial reform is progressing far too slowly. And official unemployment hovers at just above 30%. So there's hard work to be done. There's obviously a lot of work to do. But I visited this country again and again and again and again. And every time I see progress, and I know there's a bright future. I've often said that as an American, I can go all around the world, but I'll never get greeted with more love and friendship than I will in Kosovo. People there truly love Americans and all things American. So the best way to help Kosovo is through continued strong support as the United States has done for many years. But too many impediments stand in the way, many of them coming from outside of Kosovo's borders. For example, Kosovo wants what most countries across the region want, to become part of a secure and integrated Europe, membership in the European Union and in NATO, yet just five European holdouts stand in the way of this progress for Kosovo. And when it comes to United Nations membership, Kosovo's way forward is blocked by Serbia and its ally Russia. In fact, Serbia seeks to block Kosovo at almost every turn, and lately has been escalating tensions. Both Serbia and Kosovo want to go to the Euro European Union, and I support both of them getting into the European Union. But one of those countries shouldn't try to block another one, and Serbia has repeatedly tried to make it difficult for Kosovo to get into the EU and to get other things as well. Serbia recently sent into Kosovo's north a propaganda train emblazoned with the words, Serbia is Kosovo, written in 21 languages to foment discord among Kosovo's small Serbian population. It pushed the building of a wall in Mitrovica, a tiny city straddling the cleavages of Kosovo's inter-ethnic divide. While that wall has now come down, the scars remain. Serbia has continued to deny justice to the loved ones of hundreds of victims of its campaign of ethnic cleansing, including three American citizens, the Batici brothers. And there is all kinds of, of insults from a train and other things giving propaganda against Kosovo by Serbia, pushed to the Serbian-Kosovo border that helps to escalate tensions rather than bring them down. As a result of a Serbian Interpol arrest warrant, French authorities recently detained former Kosovo Prime Minister Ramush Haradnaj, who has already been acquitted twice by an international tribunal. You know, we in the United States uh, have this wonderful thing of no double jeopardy. If you go to trial and uh, you're acquitted, you cannot be tried on the same thing again. That isn't true of many countries. And so Ramush Harad and I was accused of war crimes, went to The Hague, spent many, many weeks and months there, was acquitted, and then was recharged again and had to go back to The Hague to have another trial on which he was again acquitted. Now Serbia has manipulated Interpol to try to get a third trial on the same, on essentially the same matter for Ramush Harad and I again. 
This to me is unconscionable and shows tremendous bad faith on the part of the Serbian government. Serbia also fought Kosovo's membership in UNESCO, ultimately a self-defeating act because among Kosovo's most cherished historical cultural institutions are its 13th century Serbian Orthodox churches. Kosovo did not get into UNESCO. It failed by three votes. And again, the Serbian interruption played a major role in preventing them from getting into UNESCO. The United States fought to have Kosovo into UNESCO, but ultimately again lost by three votes. Kosovo and Serbia have sat down across the negotiating table in talks facilitated by the European Union. Those talks showed some progress. They resulted in an agreement calling for normalization. I even nominated at that time the prime ministers of Kosovo and Serbia, along with the EU's former foreign policy head, Baroness Catherine Ashton, for the Nobel Peace Prize. Unfortunately, today I question these successes. What kind of normalization involves stoking tensions among a neighbor's minority population and standing in the way of international integration? That's what Serbia is doing to Kosovo, and it should be stopped. And you know, in terms of Ramush Haradnai, trying to try him again, I don't want, know why the government of Serbia seems intent on rekindling 20- and 30-year-old Balkan wars. There were terrible things that happened in war and terrible things that happened on both sides, but the man was found innocent twice, and this is nothing more uh, than bad faith on the part of the Serbian government and harassment. It might come as a surprise to you, Mr. Speaker, but nine years on, as a free and independent country, Kosovo still has no army. That's right a sovereign nation state without an army. It has a small, lightly armed security force, but nothing resembling the large Russian-equipped Serbian military just next door. Earlier this month, Kosovo took a small step toward establishing its army. Legislation was submitted to Parliament. Like the legislative process here in the United States, the introduction of a bill is only the opening note on a much lar larger and longer sheet of music a score which involves consultation with regional partners, the international community, domestic minorities, and NGOs. We all know how this process works. There's back and forth, there's give and take, supporters and opponents alike are welcome into the arena, and all positions are heard. The process accounts for everybody's concerns in some way or another. So what's in this proposal? What would Kosovo's army look like? It would, it would be multi-ethnic, just as the Kosovo Security Force and the Kosovo Police are now. It would partner with Western countries and hopefully NATO in pursuit of greater regional and international stability. It would be defensive and non-threatening to Kosovo's neighbors. Mr. Speaker, it would be exactly what the United States wants to see in a partner. Yet, while Kosovo slowly moves to set up its small defensive force, Serbia is beefing up its military with full Russian backing. It is taking deliveries of T-72 tanks, MiG-29 fighters, and S-300 anti-aircraft missile systems, courtesy of Mas Moscow and Vladimir Putin. So I'm a little confused, Mr. Speaker. Kosovo, a country we support and which supports us, wants what every other country in the world has, a basic army in which its citizens can serve their nation and probably serve alongside our own military if given the chance. What do we do? We offer rebukes and diplomatic threats, and we make it clear that we don't support Kosovo having an army at this time. That is absolutely absurd and is a position that we ought to change and change quickly. Yet Russian weapons and material are pouring into Serbia, courtesy of Vladimir Putin. And as far as I can tell, the United States has stood in silence. So regardless, Mr. Speaker, America's relation with Kosovo is strong and the future is bright. We need to stay on that course. Kosovo is a young country, and I have been there many, many times. It's not even 10 years old. 
We know better than anyone that building a democracy is hard work. Sometimes you'll face setbacks. Sometimes you need a helping hand. That's why American support is more important than ever. That's why the United States should work to deepen our ties, enrich our mutual understanding, and continue to bring stability to the entire Balkan region. That's the way to a more prosperous, democratic, and multi-ethnic Kosovo. And that's the way for the United States to see a Balkan region free, at peace, and part of the whole of Europe. Meanwhile, France should send Ramush Sharad and I home. It, enough is enough already. We cannot stand for any more of this nonsense. The United States should stand by Kosovo. Kosovo is a free and independent country. For many years, they were fed all kinds of lies about the United States during the old communist regime in the 50s and 60s and 70s. But you know what? The people of Kosovo didn't believe a word of it. So I would say to my colleagues and to my friends and to all of our American citizens, when you visit Kosovo, you'll know and you'll be proud to be an American because people come up to you in the street and want to touch you, want to talk to you, want to do everything and be everything American. And those are the kinds of friends that we need. America does much for many, many people around the world, many, many nations, and sometimes we feel it is not appreciated, but not in Kosovo. Everything the United States has helped that country with is appreciated from everyone, from the prime minister to the president, to people in government, to the average people in the street. I very often have people coming up to me in the street, wanting to talk to me. They recognize me. They say thank you. Thank you to America for standing by us in our independence. Thank you to America for being strong and keeping us strong. And so those are the kinds of friends I want to have. Those are the kind of people I want to have. So I would say to the people of Kosovo and the government of Kosovo, the United States stands by you and always will stand by you. And I would say to the government of Serbia, we support the aspirations of the Serbian people to enter the European Union, but Serbia ought to stop doing what it's doing to block Kosovo. Serbia ought to stop its belligerent moves against Kosovo. Both countries should go into the European Union and eventually NATO. And each one should not help, should not stop each other. They should help each other. I want to spend the next uh, couple of moments talking about a subject that is very near and dear to everyone's heart, and that's health care. And I want to do it because tomorrow we have a big uh, health care vote uh, here in the Congress. And I think it's very uh, important uh, that we all very clearly uh, lay out uh, what we really feel should happen. Uh, last week, uh, as part of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, I was up for about 28 hours in a row uh, marking up a bill uh, that was uh, done all night long. And at the time when we marked it up, we thought it was a bit silly because the bill hadn't been scored by the Congressional Budget Office, so we had no idea what it cost. And it was like buying a pig in a poke. How could you decide whether something is good or not when you don't even know what the cost is? And you don't even know, since we obviously don't have unlimited funds, uh, we have to, if something costs more money, we have to pull it out of someplace else. So we voted on a bill, unfortunately, it was on strict uh, party line vote. And the bill passed, and shortly thereafter, a few days later, the Congressional Budget Office scored it. And uh, I think it was, a, frankly, from my vantage point, a disaster for the bill. Now, what I think that this Congress should be doing is I think that we should make tweaks and fix the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. There are many, many good things in, the, in, the, uh, in Obamacare, in the health care bill, in the Health Care Act that has now been, uh, been here for many, many years. But there are also some problems with it. You know, every major bill that has been passed by this Congress and signed into law you needed some tweaks, needed some changes, because you pass a law with good intention, but sometimes it doesn't work out exactly as you wanted it to work out. So you need to change things. You need to make improvements. When you see what's working, what's not working, that's what you do. That's what this Congress should do with Obamacare. We should say where premiums are going up or where certain jurisdictions only have one uh, insurance company and therefore there's no competition, we can figure out ways to fix it. We can figure out ways to tweak it. That's what the American people would want us to do. The American people would want us to work together 
and would want us to work in a bipartisan fashion to try to fix what was wrong with Obamacare. Now, there were many wonderful things about Obamacare. First of all, uh, everyone knows it eliminated the so-called pre-existing condition problem, where before, when you changed jobs and you went to a new insurance company, the insurance company said, sorry, you've uh, had cancer for three years and you've had treated, we're not going to treat you for cancer because it's a pre-existing condition, or a heart attack, or whatever it is, that was basically unconscionable, and millions of people couldn't get help because they changed the job and therefore changed the health care plan. That was changed in Obamacare. And that was a very, very important thing because an insurance company can now no longer deny you coverage because of a pre-existing condition. Also, as everybody knows, children up to 26 years old can now continue to keep their insurance. They can stay and be insured under their parents' insurance plans. That was a very good plus of Obamacare or of the Affordable Care Act. And there were other very, very important good things. We had more people uh, being covered uh, than ever before. People who had never had health coverage got it now because of the Affordable Care Act. So what do we see now? We see instead of trying to put it together in a bipartisan fashion, trying to fix it, we have this bill which, which passed the Energy and Commerce Committee and passed the Ways and Means Committee and supposedly is going to be on the floor tomorrow if they can round up the votes. They're having difficulty rounding up the votes. And what do we see when we look at this new bill that they're asking us to vote for? Let me tell you what we see. If this bill would ever come into law, we would have much less coverage than ever before. Many people would lose their health care coverage and we would have smaller and a smaller population actually being covered for health care. We call it Trump care. And Trump care will take away health care from 24 million hard-working Americans. That's not acceptable. Why shouldn't we be working together to improve Obamacare? Why do we need a new plan that will ensure 24 million less people than we insure now. It's bizarre. It makes no sense whatsoever. We also feel when we analyze it, and this is again what the Congressional Budget Office tell us, tells us, there are higher costs. So Trump Care forces families to pay increased out-of-pocket costs and higher deductibles. So what does that all mean? It means you pay more and you get less. That's a pretty bad deal. I don't think anybody wants that deal. I think Democrats and Republicans alike don't want that deal. I think Americans don't want that deal. We want it the opposite way. We'd like to pay less and get coverage. But what Trump Care does to the Affordable Care Act, you pay more and you get less. If that wasn't bad enough, an analysis of it finds that there's a crushing age tax. Trump Care forces Americans between the ages of 50 and 64 to pay premiums which are five times higher than what others pay for health coverage, no matter how healthy they are. Talk about discrimination. If you're a 50-year-old that's in good health, why should you have to pay five times more coverage, more premium than what others pay for health coverage? Doesn't sound like a very good idea to me. And then you say, how do they get the money to pay for whatever? Well, it steals from Medicaid and Medicare. Trump Care ransacks the Medicaid funds that allow seniors to get the long-term care they need and shortens the life of the Medicare Trust Fund by three years. Again, pretty bad deal for me. And you say, well, who benefits from this? If, if this is something that people are going to have to pay more and get less coverage, it's discriminatory from people ages 50 to 64, uh, it hurts middle class people making 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars a year. Hurts them and hurts seniors, knocks seniors out. Well, who does it help? Well, guess what? Trump Care ransacks the Medicaid funds that allow seniors to get the long term care they need. I said that before, but what does it do? It lowers tax cuts for the rich. So the rich gets more, more, of ta more tax cuts. I'm sorry, it doesn't lower it. It gives the rich 
more tax cuts. So it's really kind of nice. I suppose when you have a billionaire president, it's nice to help the rich, but not at the expense of middle-class America. So when you look at this plan, it's a pretty bad plan for the middle class. Pretty bad. So if you didn't like Obamacare, you're going to dislike Trump care even more. And if it's passed, once it's passed, we're going to see again premiums rise, millions of people thrown out of insurance, and less coverage. But the very wealthy will get a nice, juicy tax break. So, you know, who used to steal from the, from the rich and give to the poor? This is stealing from the poor and giving to the rich. It's really disgraceful. So I call on my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Let's defeat Trump care because it doesn't help anybody. And let's put our heads together. We have enough talent in this, in this place on both sides of the aisle. And that's what the American people want us to do. They want us to put our heads together. They want us to work together and come up for a plan that, with a plan that aids the largest amount of people at the lowest possible cost. It won't be easy. It'll be very difficult. But we should do it together, not jam Trump care down our throat. Not tell people about false promises when you know people are going to be thrown off. If you say, well, you know what? It's going to be cheaper. Well, it's cheaper if you throw off all the sick people and you don't give them insurance, and you throw off all the seniors, and you don't help them, well, of course it's cheaper, because all the people that are sick and really need the help won't get it. And after all, what's insurance about? Insurance is there just in case you get sick. So I am very um, chagrined about this new bill. I hope it gets defeated tomorrow, and I hope that we then go back to the drawing board and come up with a program that will help the American people. Not a program that helps Democrats or a program that helps Republicans, but a program that helps Americans, because we're all in this together. And the bill proposed by my Republican colleagues called Trump Care is not a bill for Americans that will aid them with help when they get sick. As Americans, I do believe that health care should be a right, not a luxury. I believe that the richest country that the world has ever known can give its citizens health care. I believe in the single payer health care, but even if it's not single payer, let's take the original Affordable Care Act, keep what's good, enhance what's good, and what needs to be corrected and changed, let's do it. That's what the American people want, that's what the American people demand, and we should do nothing less. This bill ought to be defeated tomorrow. Let's go back to the drawing board and come up with something we can be proud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time.